My name is Hannah and this is my no buy year. Okay, before we start, I am, as the kids are saying these days, on the struggle bus with my eyeshadow today. Both of my eyes are watering relentlessly, so if it starts to get kind of patchy and weird around the corners of my eyes, or like a little bit unflatteringly smudgy, too, too grungy, that's what's going on. Please don't clock me in the comments. And the other thing I wanna say before we start is that the topic of this video is should you do a no buy my experience and advice? I think that's what I'm calling it. It's the question of whether or not you should do a no buy. That's what I'm calling it. But I need to tell you that there is pretty much nothing I despise more in this world than someone telling me what they think I should do. I have a particular issue actually with the word should. When anyone ever says, you should blah, 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 no matter what the thing is, my hackles go up. And I'll even notice it when I'm like going through the comments. If someone says, hey, Hannah, I think you would really like X, Y, Z. I'm like, oh, great. Thank you so much for the advice. And the next person types, hey, Hannah, you should try X, Y, Z. I'm like, you should fucking mind your own business. Yeah. Like I can't, I, I get like all, and I know that you, I'm not trying to criticize people who use that language in the comments because I know in my brain that it means the same thing. I know that people say you should try X. What they really mean is I think that you would like X. I think that maybe my issue with the word should just comes from a long history of being told by men what they think I should do, especially because I'm a small business owner and I'm a woman. A lot of times when I'm out at tango festivals vending, it seems like there's nothing that a certain kind of man loves to do more than to come up to my booth and sit down and just tell me how I should run my business. And these men never have experience themselves running small handmade tango clothing businesses. They just think that they know better because they're men and I'm a young woman. I'm not even that young. I think I look younger than I am. I have grown to have less than zero tolerance for that behavior and unfortunately for everybody it's like spread to every use of the word should. This intro is getting so long, maybe I should cut this whole section. Hannah! Yeah, talking about the word should is like making my eyes water. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you that you should do a no buy year or a no buy at all. I will never do that. I will never say to anyone, you should do a no buy because I'm not in the habit of telling people what they should and shouldn't do. And I put that language in the title because it just made sense for the title. I think you guys can get that. The point of this long rambling intro is just to say that only you can decide whether or not you should do a no buy. This video is based entirely on my experience. I'm gonna share my experience with you. I'm gonna share with you what drove me to do a no buy, what made me decide that I should do a no buy. And hopefully, my experience can be one of the factors that helps you extrapolate, that helps you decide whether or not you should do a no buy or even a no buy year. Let's go ahead and get into the meat of the video. The first thing I'm going to do is to talk about my own past behaviors, my own former habits, the habits that I observed in myself that drove me to decide to do a no buy year. And then later in the video, I'm gonna talk about what made me choose to do a whole year. So here's what I was doing. At the end of 2017 specifically, I had by that time developed all of these habits. Some of them were cumulative, like I had picked them up over the course of the past several years because I have been a lover of shopping for, I would say, my entire life. But many of them had intensified and become much more present in my life in the wake of the 2016 presidential election. So here's what was going on for me at the end of 2017. One, I was spending unwisely on makeup. I don't think I would have denied this. I don't think I would have wanted to talk about it, and I might have tried to skirt around the issue, but I know that in my heart of hearts, I knew that my spending was unwise. I knew that the majority of what I was spending on makeup and skincare, I should have been investing or saving in some way. I knew that it was too much. So that was pretty clear. It's hard to say that it was clear because I want to think that if I had been able to say to myself, you're spending unwisely on makeup, I would have just stopped but it's not that simple. 
I was spending unwisely on makeup and I knew it, but I was continuing to do it anyway. Number two, I had a deeply skewed sense of how much things should cost. And this is one that I'm not sure I did know or that I would have been able to admit. I think maybe in my heart of hearts I did know this, but I had been so sucked in by the hype and the marketing and the YouTube and the experience of going to the mall and being in Sephora and being in Ulta that I had a new <laughs> I had a new map of price land in terms of cosmetics and skincare. And I remember at the beginning of the year thinking that $42 wasn't all that much to spend on a hydrating essence. And by the time I got most of the way through the year, it came time to buy that exact essence. And I was like, there's no way that I would spend $42 on that. I have, over the course of the no buy year, developed a much clearer sense of how much is too much and of how crazy overpriced certain things are, especially when we want to have like an extensive skincare routine, which I'll get into in a later video. Looking back, I know that I had a deeply skewed sense of how much things should cost in the beauty realm. And I'm not sure whether I knew that then, but it was it was happening. Three, this I did know. I was afraid to look hard at my finances and start financial planning. I was always afraid to look inside my bank account because I was afraid of what I would find or rather what I wouldn't find. I would spend money and then I would be afraid to check up on how much I had actually spent. And I would spend money without really knowing what the implications were. I would spend it without knowing what percentage of what was left in my account I was spending. I would just kind of cross my fingers and have magical thinking and hope that it would all work out okay. And somehow it kind of usually did, except that sometimes I would get kind of far into credit card debt and then somehow I would scrape myself out of it. But what that meant was that I was very, very reticent to think about financial planning for the future. I was unable to think about socking money away, investing money, because I had a fear of looking at my finances. Because I had this association, every time I looked at my finances, I had to face what I had done, which was that I had spent unwisely on makeup and skincare. I had overspent, spent more than I meant to, and I didn't like that feeling. So the way that I avoided feeling that feeling was by avoiding looking at my finances. And that was, in retrospect, a huge red flag. Um, and I knew that it was like that. I knew it for years and I didn't do anything about it until the beginning of 2018. Okay, number four, and this is related to number three. I was buying things to experience a temporary feeling of wealth and fanciness instead of saving and planning for a future of actual prosperity. I would feel these feelings like I want to have a future of prosperity. I want to be financially secure in the future. I want to be a woman who can go into Sephora and buy a $50 eyeshadow palette without worrying about the financial implications of that. That was a vision that I had for myself. That was my fantasy self. It still is, but you know what I'm saying? Like that was something I dreamed of and that I wanted to work towards. But because of three, because I was afraid to look at my finances and plan for the future, the band-aid that I was putting on that despair that I didn't know how to start getting there, I didn't know how to get on the road, the band-aid was that I would go into Sephora and buy the $50 eyeshadow palette anyway to temporarily feel like I was a fancy person to temporarily feel like someone who could afford that thing. So I would get the thing, I would have the thing, I would use the thing, and I would be like, I'm a woman who has this thing. I'm a woman who wears this expensive thing. And that would give me a little respite. It would provide a little fantasy time during which I felt like because I had managed to buy the thing, I was prosperous. But it wasn't true. It was a lie. It was... It was a temporary fix, and it was related to the anxiety about the fact that I was spending away that money that I should have been saving. It was this crazy, weird, anxious cycle, and I think some of you will probably be able to relate to that. I am not sure I had total clarity about that until partway into my no-buy year. I might have been able to figure it out if I had sat down and really done some thinking about it. I kind of knew I was doing it, but I see it very clearly now in retrospect. Number five, shopping was, and this is so embarrassing for, for a writer, for an artist, for a voracious reader, shopping was my main form of recreation. 
And this really was one that didn't become totally true until after the election because I had always enjoyed shopping, but it had never been my main form of recreation. I had always done more reading than shopping, more writing than shopping, more other creative things, hanging out with friends, dancing tango, teaching, living my best life. I had always done more living my best life than shopping. But after the election, shopping was like the only thing that was shallow enough not to remind me of how awful things felt and yet interesting and creative enough and, and compelling enough to keep my attention. Sephora was my happy place. Clothing stores were my happy place. The mall was my happy place. Isn't that gross? But during those really troubling months that stretched into a troubling year for me, it was true. Online stores were my happy place. And I wasn't always spending money, but I was engaging in what I call shopping behaviors more than I ever had in my life. And it, it became way, way too much. It, it took over my my recreational energy. It, it took over a, a lot of my brain, <laughs> too much, too much of my brain. So number six, I didn't really know what I had. And I had a lot of things, makeup, skincare, clothing, bath and body care. I don't think I could have recalled on command or kind of reviewed on command the stuff that I had. I was just swimming in stuff. I, I had no sense of what was there and how much it was and, and even how well it all worked. I had a bunch of stuff floating around that I couldn't have reviewed, like that I didn't know about. At this point, I feel like I could review anything except for what's in the purgatory box. And that's how I want it to continue to be from now on into the future. But at that time, I, I didn't know what I had and I didn't know how it worked. I, I had more than I could, could hold in my mind, if that makes sense. Oh, number seven, this is a big one. I was always looking for something to want. I was always looking for something to want to buy because the patterns in my brain had trained me to know that if I wanted something, then I had access to pleasure because then I could buy the thing that I wanted. I could fulfill my desire. So I wanted to want. And sometimes I just, I ran out of things to want. Sometimes I'd be walking down the street in LA or I would be in a Sephora, I would be in a clothing store and I genuinely wouldn't want anything or there wouldn't be anything there that I felt like was worth the money to me or I didn't want to spend any money or was out of money and I couldn't. And I would still be there looking for something to want, trying to get it up to want a thing because my old brain, my old demented brain knew that if I could build up enough desire for a thing, then I could fulfill that desire and have that temporary burst of dopamine. So that feeling of wanting to want, like I would be, even on just like a lunch break in downtown LA, I would be walking around and I would be kind of like looking in the little bodegas and stores and I would be looking for something to want. Always combing. And it was constant. And when my no by year started, it was one of the first things I noticed because my brain was still doing that. And then my other part of my brain was like, why are you doing that? You can't buy anything anymore. You're not, you're not allowed to buy anything. It wasn't until I took away the possibility of buying that I realized that I had developed this habit of spending every waking moment looking for something to want. And I would do it online too. If I was online or if I had any free time, I would immediately get on the internet and start looking for something to want. Looking at the clothing stores, looking at Sephora, looking at other cosmetics companies. All right, number eight. And this is the last thing that I have on here of the list of eight things that I was doing that made me decide that I should start a no buy. I felt a sense of panic when I wanted something and there was a chance that it would sell out before I could get it. Or if I realized retroactively that I wanted something that was no longer available, I would feel a sense of total panic and I would start kind of combing eBay for it or combing other websites. Some, you know, I would, if, if I felt like there was something that I wanted and there was scarcity or there was a chance that it might be impossible to get, it was like I was possessed by <laughs> the makeup goblin, as Nisa says, or some kind of shopping demon that would just do anything and in some cases pay anything to get that item. 
that's bananas. I mean, I can say that now. I totally understand what was driving me to do that. I understand what it was like. I, I, I'm not saying that it's the behavior of a crazy person, but it was unsustainable for me and I wasn't okay with that. And um, it was yet another thing that made me realize that I had to take drastic measures. So that was me at the end of 2017 and that was what made me decide to do a no-buy year. If that's you, I recommend a no-buy. This is the closest I'm gonna come to saying you should do a no-buy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should. You know what you should do. What I'm saying is that it's something that I recommend if what I just described was a pretty close description of you. And your problem might not be with clothes and makeup like mine was. You might have other stuff going on. You know yourself, but if what I just outlined echoes your experience, I recommend a no-buy with rules that you tailor for yourself. If you don't have any of the problems that I just told you about, if my experience that I just described doesn't sound familiar to you in any way, if you're young and you don't have a lot of spending money and you're just starting to figure out your personal style or you're just starting to experiment with makeup, I don't actually recommend a no-buy for you. What I recommend in that case is a budget. For me, my no-buy was a way to correct a problem that I had developed because I didn't train myself to budget. In fact, I let corporations train me to overspend. But if you haven't let that happen, if you don't have a problem, then just start with a budget and let that be your project. All right, I want to address the fact that a no-buy is a cold turkey project and the phrase that I hear all over YouTube and all over Reddit, which is cold turkey doesn't work for everyone. I hear this a lot, cold turkey doesn't work for me, cold turkey doesn't work for everyone. So the question I wanna address in this section of the video is, does cold turkey work for everyone? And I wanna leave room for the fact that everyone's experience is different and I cannot answer, I, can, I know that I cannot answer that question because I'm not a psychologist. I have done some research though, I have typed into Google, does cold turkey work for everyone? A lot of what I have turned up has indicated that the answer is kind of yes, actually, but I, I want to say here that I'm leaving space for you if you're out there and you're like, Hannah, you genuinely don't understand me. I am a person who, for some reason, like some reason that I, Hannah, can't discern right now or didn't uncover in my Google research, can't do cold turkey, truly cannot. I'm leaving room for that. But having said that, I'm going to answer this question in my own way for what I hope is the benefit of some people out there who might need to hear what I have to say. Habits run so deep. Crutches like these are so hard to let go of. And issues like the ones that I described before, habits like the habits that I had, they are so, so, so hard to break. And in order to change a bad habit like that without going cold turkey, you have to have a tremendous amount of self-awareness, self-control, and grit. And for compulsive shoppers, in many cases, those are the things that we're struggling to scrape together. We are shopping and shopping and shopping to look away from something. We're indulging in out of control feelings and we're letting it be okay that we don't have the grit to make change. I am a big proponent of cold turkey because I tried the baby steps approach for years and it got me nowhere. Years before the problems got as bad as they did because I, was spending unwisely on beautiful things for years, even before the 2016 election. I knew I had a problem and I tried to spend less and I tried to do better so many times. I've spent my life trying to change this habit using the baby steps approach and it never worked. It only got worse. I was too clever at convincing myself to dive back into my old overspending ways. I was too eager to reward myself for good behavior with a return to bad behavior. If you have used the baby steps approach to make massive and permanent change to your behaviors in the past, if you have done that and you know that you're capable of doing it here, then maybe cold turkey isn't for you. I can't speak to that because baby steps have always failed me. So I'm leaving room for the extreme diversity of human behavior. I know that not everyone is like me, but I have had such wild success with cold turkey projects that I can't help but want to suggest that you give it a try. 
And with that in mind, I feel compelled to give this little tough love pep talk. If you identify as someone who can't stand rules and you think that you won't be able to do a no buy or a low buy because you will compulsively break any rules that you put in place because that's just your personality, it might be worth asking yourself if you really want to continue to be that way. If you identify as someone who can't make rules and stick to them, then you identify as someone who can't take control of her own life can't make change for herself, can't aspire to a goal and then work her way towards that goal. You actually can make rules and then stick to them if you really want to. Be honest with yourself. Saying, oh, cold turkey just won't work for me might be a much better sounding way of saying I won't commit, I won't try hard enough to succeed because I choose not to change myself. And again, I'm sure that's not relevant to all of you, but in case there are a few of you out there watching who know in your heart of hearts that you really do need a no buy, but you're lying to yourself and saying, oh, I could never do a no buy year or I could never do a no buy, when what you really mean is a no buy year would be really hard and I don't wanna do a hard thing. Well, there you go, that pep talk was for you. Tough love, you guys, tough love, love being the operative word. Okay, lastly, I wanna address the length of the no buy. I chose a year because I knew I had a, b a bad problem and I felt like I was going to need a lot more than a couple of months to reverse it. Popular science, I believe, says that it takes 21 days to break a habit, but the reading that I've done has indicated that it can take a lot, a lot longer than that. And for me, it did. It took a lot longer than 21 days for my brain to start actually changing. My behavior changed on January 1st because I enforced my rules and I wasn't about to break them. So my behavior changed, but my brain did not, and the habits of my brain did not, not for months. I spent the first six months of my no-buy heavily engaged in shopping behaviors. Every time I needed to replace something because I was on a replacements only no buy. So if I ran out completely of something that I considered a staple, I was allowed to replace it. Every time I had to replace something, I would place a separate order from Sephora so that I would receive as many separate boxes in the mail as possible. I was excited every time I ran out of something because it meant that I got to place another order. I was buying luxury or high-end products into almost every category that I was replacing. I never broke my rules ever, but I did take advantage of the shape of my rules to ape my old behavior to the very best of my ability while still staying within the technical confines of my rules. And that is okay. I actually believe that my period of obeying my rules in letter, if not in spirit, was necessary. I could not have gone from how I was to how I am now just by enforcing rules like the flip of a switch. It takes time for the brain to change and it was okay to give myself a little elbow room, a little breathing room during that time. In fact, again, I actually think it was probably necessary. Now, those of you who have been following me through the year or who have gone back and watched my check-ins will know this, but it was around July that I started really feeling different. It had been about six months I started getting annoyed when it was time to replace something because I didn't want to spend the money. I started waiting on replacing things until I had enough that I could group a number of things together in one order so that I would only have to receive one box in the mail instead of receiving a bunch of different boxes in the mail because I didn't want to receive any boxes in the mail anymore. I started practicing going without a product for a couple of days after I ran out of it to make absolutely sure that I felt like I needed it in my routine to make absolute sure that I missed it before I placed that order to replace it. And I started feeling like I was spending way too much money on fancy skincare and on certain luxury makeup items. I essentially went from following new behaviors with my old mindset through to following new behaviors because of a new mindset. So in retrospect, I would not have assigned myself a no buy shorter than six months. The six month point was the point at which I really started to feel like I had succeeded in changing my brain. But I still had a lot to learn and a lot of no buy life to live during the second half of the year and I'm really glad that I stuck it out. I, I loved doing a whole year. 
So if you are the way I was, if the list of behaviors that I read off at the beginning really resonates with you, and you want to do a no buy to affect real and lasting change in your brain and in your life, then I prescribe no less than six months. And I do recommend a year if you feel like you can do it. You'll be in good company. I suspect that 2019 will be the year of the no buy here on YouTube. And I also think it's going to be the year of the no buy in the makeup rehab subreddit where I've found a lot of support during the course of my no buy. However, if a year seems too long, or even six months, if what I've said, if what I've suggested or prescribed seems too long, and in your heart of hearts you know that you wouldn't be able to make it, then I suggest you choose something shorter. I suggest that you start with a no buy that you know that you can convince yourself that you will follow through with. Because when you start a no buy, a real, lasting, life-changing, brain-changing, true, successful no buy, you have to know inside yourself that you won't break it. You have to have truly decided that you won't break it. You have to build one that you can embark upon with confidence in yourself. But we are getting into now the meat of another video. I am actually going to film a separate video that includes all of my advice for how to launch a successful no buy. And that should be the next video of mine that goes up. It should be going up on Wednesday, so keep an eye out for that one. For this video, that is it. That is my personal experience and advice when it comes to the question of whether or not you should do a no buy. Most of it, all of it was just based on what made me decide that it was what was right for me and also in retrospect what makes me sure that it was the right decision and what makes me really, really glad that I decided to do it. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions for me, do go ahead and leave them in the comment section down below, but be aware that if you have questions about how to do a successful no buy, I'm just about to film that video. So all of those questions hopefully will be answered on Wednesday. And if they aren't, then you can ask about them on Wednesday. But if you have questions about whether or not you think you should do a no buy, if you're trying to decide and you'd like my opinion or you'd like others to weigh in, please leave those questions in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you will remember to take extra good care of yourself this week so that you can be the most effective version of yourself as you do your work in the world.